Uh, right, hello everyone. Um, I'm Tom, and I am going to be talking about that title. Um, so, as a bit of an introduction to me and uh, the company I work for, uh, the Science and Technologies Facilities Council is a uh, organisation based in the UK. We run large-scale scientific re resources that you, that for instance, you wouldn't be able to run at a university. Large um, particle accelerators, hard x-ray sources um, and pulsed lasers, all sorts of things, generally trying to provide free at point of use access to academics, um, as well as providing access to commercial users. Um, we're part of a wider organisation which is called the UK Research and Innovation um, yeah, organisation. Um, we do a lot of science on site, um, a lot of data heavy science, and we have a scientific computing department um, that backs backs this up. Um, I've listed some things there. Um, we have a large, nearly 100,000 cores of um, OpenStack, uh, which is used heavily by the scientific groups uh, to build their analysis workflows on top of. We run a lot of Ceph of various flavors behind that um, to support it. Um, and then we do sort of the stuff that builds on top of that, the data lifecycle management and all sorts of things that you sort of associate with doing computing for science. Um, because we have a lot of um, resource and expertise on site, we also participate in external collaborations, not supporting science that is happening on site, but supporting other science around the world. Um, and one highlight of that is the Worldwide LHC Computing Grid. We're one of the tier one compute sites um, that provides compute and storage um, and tape storage uh, for the LHC experiments. Uh, my role in the department is as it, I design and build storage solutions um, for our facility users and for external external users. Cool. So, um, ECHO is one of the clusters we run. It is by far the largest cluster we run. Um, it has been in production for over five years now and it's grown from about 10 petabytes to its current size of 64, 65 petabytes um, over that time. Um, it will very shortly grow a lot more. Um, there is another 60 petabytes um, of hardware racked and ready to go. Um, so it is going to, it's going to continue to grow. Um, and I put that bullet point there because I don't really talk about this through the talk and I don't, don't want it to sound like I'm, I'm, I'm annoyed with it. Um, in general, Ceph has worked really well. Um, yeah, we've been running this cluster in production for years. Um, it's done everything as advertised. We've been able to add generations to it, um, decommission old generations, deal with hardware failures. It's, yeah, it, it's Ceph. It actually works well for this sort of thing. Um, the data that's stored in ECHO is all in EC8 plus 3 pools. We've got over 30 petabytes of data stored in it now, and at any given time you can expect to see something like 20 gigabytes a second of transfer onto our analysis cluster. Um, so this is yeah a fairly big and fairly well-used cluster. Um, ECHO's purpose is uh, for providing yeah, as I was saying, disk storage to the LHC experiments, um, and it's providing the majority of the UK's contribution to that. Um, it exists where it exists because it's effectively close to a dedicated high throughput, high throughput computing um, analysis cluster um, that is running um, various types of workflows um, that is, well, yeah, various workflows that the LHC experiments are running. Uh, run on that farm and need large amounts of online disk storage um, that can that can be used to scratch space and used to stage data. Um, yeah, as a I'm not a particle physicist. Um, as a very sort of uh, yeah, very hand wavy explanation as to roughly what's actually going on here. Um, particle physics or the type of particle physics that's done at the LHC involves. Uh, collisions happening um, and then also simulated collisions happening based on our current understanding. Um, you end up with raw output from both of those. You reconstruct that into the actual what the particles were doing in both cases and then it's the, the, the actual physics or the 
where you get the result is the comparison of those of those two of the simulated and the real the real collisions um, and so echo and the compute it lives next to um, they are there to support those bulk production runs as well as the, the user analysis that happens afterwards cool so a little bit about the LHC and what's happening in the future um, we're into into run three of the LHC so this is there was a long shutdown where there were detector and magnet upgrades um, we're back in it's, it's back running there's a there's beams circulating and there's collisions happening and data and data being taken. Um, in general, with this type of physics, you're yeah you're looking for as many collisions as possible. Um, your yeah your results are based on statistical significance. Um, so the more higher luminosity you can get, um, that's how how many particles there are in the bunches. Um, the more the more data you get out. Um, and to that end. Um, the next major run of the LHC is going to be called is going to be the high luminosity LHC. Uh, a collection of key upgrades are going to ramp up the um, amount of collisions that are being recorded and the resulting data rate um, by significant. Well, yeah, significantly. Um, and so to prepare for this, we've got various data challenges to try and try and make sure everybody is everybody is ready. Um, the various bits of the infrastructure already, um, and yeah, I think it's really um, the the figures on on the left. Um, they're not you can't directly correlate them with what this Ceph cluster will need to be doing. Um, the top one we're looking at the disk requirements for one LHC experiment based on various predictions. Um, so yeah, the numbers get quite large, um, and then on the bottom we're looking at. Our, our site's specific networking requirements for raw data input. Um, so we're talking, yeah, kind of orders of magnitude more, more data being expected, which is going to be an interesting challenge um, over the next few years. Um, so yeah, so I think, yeah, chasing efficiency is quite important for us at this stage. Um, things have worked for a long time, but there haven't really been any significant challenges. So this is the story of one particular investigation into into one aspect of Echo and how it performs. Um, I thought it was an interesting story. Um, but in order to tell that story, I need to give a bit more context, sorry. Um, uh, yeah, so Echo is, it is a Ceph cluster, um, but it is not accessed through any of the traditional uh, Ceph cluster. Yeah, it's not CephFS. Um, so in high energy physics, most of the storage uh, uses something called XRoot D, um, a yeah, data transfer framework, um, to uh, as as the access gateway. Um, XRoot D is highly pluggable, uh, with sort of pluggable authentication methods and pluggable storage backends. Um, there is a storage backend XRD Ceph, um, which uses something called Liberato Striper, which I'll get into in a second, um, to interface directly with Ceph at a fairly low level. You're basically talking Rados Plus a little bit. Um, yeah, and in addition to well, yeah, in addition to this, um, in order to remove a lot of the gateway bottlenecks that you sort of have when you have a gateway, um, we try and run as many of the gateway stacks in our in in places in our infrastructure as possible so that the external gateways are simply dealing with traffic coming in from external places. All of our analysis traffic is actually the worker node talking directly to the Ceph cluster, um, which works fairly well in practice. Cool, uh, one more level down. Um, as I was saying, XRD Ceph is basically just talking Librados uh, plus a small striping interface. Um, this has one major benefit um, of there is no file system. Um, maybe I'm not sure if benefit is the right word. Um, there is no file system. Um, there is very little metadata load on the actual Ceph cluster. Um, this is really cool, and we can get away with this um, because experiments are actually they have they have their experimental data catalogs. They understand where where their data is and which sites they've replicated it to. Um, they're not using the, or the, well, those 
the files look like they're in a file system, they're not using the directory structure um, for, for anything. Um, so this is acceptable in this case. Um, and then finally, a little bit about Libretto Striper. Um, this is a, it's, it's actually a part of Ceph. Um, I'm not sure many people know it's a part of Ceph, um, but it is a very thin, thin layer on top of Libratos um, that allows you to write a file in um, and it will stripe it over multiple Rados objects. Um, it's basically the thing that every, every other part of Ceph, CephFS, RGW, um, and RVD is already doing. Um, and it was at one point there was a hope that it would be a common interface um, to do that, but everything implements their own way of doing chunking and striping. Um, but yes, so it's, there are various reasons why it's a good idea to not have massive objects in your Ceph cluster. Um, so having a striping layer or having a, a layer that is chunking things into small, predictably sized Rados objects underneath is really important, and that's what Libretto Striper is for XRD Ceph. Um, one thing to point out is that because you've at this point you've got multiple Rados objects, um, you've suddenly lost some of some of the functionality you get of being able to lock Rados objects and have atomic operations. Um, because just because you lock one object doesn't mean the other object is locked; uh, the rest of the file is locked. Um, so there's Libretto Striper implements various various mechanisms to try and cope with that and ensure some level of atomicity um, for, yeah, for reads that span, st span multiple objects. So yeah, a um, little bit about the data um, that's actually, the, what's actually stored in ECHO. Um, most physics data is stored in a format that nobody will have heard of people are unlikely to have heard of something called it's a root format um, it's very similar to something like HDF5 it's just a hierarch hierarchical data format um, that's useful for storing multiple streams of data in a way that can then be used by the analysis framework um, to yeah to extract various bits um, the kind of the layout can sort of be thought of as a row column thing uh, if you think of column they're called branches, but they're effectively groups of columns. Um, and so a collision event will typically be a row, and then it will have various columns or various groups of columns, or branches as they're actually called, um, which will be for the different physics objects, the actual particles that are involved in the collision. Um, this is important because analysis jobs would often be focusing on specific physics objects. They won't be interested in the complete contents of every collision that's in a that's in a root file they'll just be looking at each row and then looking at a specific branch of each row um, and so you often end up with very sparse uh, reads um, of you know, of these large so there'll be large multi gigabyte object with lots of collisions and you'll be doing very small you'll be doing small read seek small read seek um, and you'll be doing this against remote storage because you don't want to be downloading the entire, you don't want to be downloading a file just to do a tiny amount of read and then deleting it. Um, this is all sufficiently common and has been sufficiently common, um, a common part of the workflow, that there is a, an encapsulation of a read, a vector read, um, which is supported in XRoot D, um, which yeah, allows you to say a bunch of offset length um, into a vector and then that's, that gets passed to the XRD server and then it can pass you back the bytes you requested without having to end up with a load of round trips. So getting to the root, <laughs> getting to the beginning of the problem here, um, small read performance in the stack I've described, XR, XRD, Ceph, Libretto, Striper on top of EC pools um, has, was problematic from, from the get-go. Um, we noticed this and mitigated it with caching in various parts of our, our infrastructure um, but it was always it was it was always viewed to be a problem um, but as I say because we were able to mitigate it um, it wasn't something that was looked into for some time um, yeah um, so yeah we had some we had some effort to be able to actually fit, try and understand and fix the underlying performance problem um, and so the first thing to do is to make sure we actually understand what is going on here. 
what is it why is the what is the read doing and why is it slow um, or what are the small reads doing um, and so the first thing to look at um, is EC um, make sure make sure we're happy that EC reads can be fast so small EC reads can be fast um, make sure yeah make sure we understand what's actually happening here so as a very quick refresher I'm sure this isn't uh, this isn't news for most people. Um, erasure coding happens at the Rados object level. Um, the object will be when an object is written in, um, it will be processed in what's called stri in stripe width um, ranges. Stripe width is a pool setting, um, and it defaults to I think it's four kilobytes times uh, times k. Um, but yeah, you can have a, you can have a look at that. Um, yeah, so you it gets the EC calculation happens in stripe width chunks. Um, you divide your your stripe width into your uh, data chunks, so you're simply dividing the stripe width um, size thing, and then you're doing the EC calculation to get your parity chunks. Um, these then get sent off to the OSDs in the placement group. Um, this is yep. Yeah, works as, as expected um, and then this is repeated for every stripe width of the object um, so one interesting quirk of this is your objects on disk aren't actually like a it's not the first eighth of an object of your rados object it's like a slightly odd it's, it's the yeah the first one eighth of a stripe width and then a gap and then um, and then the next stripe width first bit um, which is interesting but it's doesn't matter for the, for when you're reading out, because yeah, this is all this is all hidden. Um, so what does this mean for a small EC read? Um, uh, as you might have guessed, the stripe width is somewhat important. Um, uh, this is the sort of the, the smallest size at which stuff can be done. There's a big big caveat here, but this is generally the smallest size that it can be done, uh, that things can be done at. So you're reconstructing a stripe width, and then you're extracting the 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 data that you want to send back to the client. Um, yeah, if you don't have to, if you if all of the data shards, um, or the data OSDs are available, you're not doing any EC, so this is efficient. Um, there's no there's no particular overhead here. Um, yeah, th this all works reasonably well. Um, yeah, the big caveat here is I did all of this analysis on a Nautilus cluster, and then I was chatting to one of the developers, and they said it's actually much more efficient now. Um, and you can do substripe um, retrievals. So if you're asking for a byte range that lives entirely on a single OSD, um, the primary will just go and talk to that OSD. So it's actually even better, um, which is very cool. Um, so yeah, so EC reads are fast and should be efficient. So that's almost certainly not where not where the problem is. Um, so the next place to look is Librado Striper, and I've already hinted at it. Librado Striper is trying to ensure some level of um, yeah atomicity for reads. Um, so that's specifically making sure that people aren't trying to truncate objects or truncate Librado Striper files when they're being read. Um, and you can imagine that when you start talking about very small reads, if you're doing things like trying to take try, trying to update locks um, it's going to get very expensive and that's exactly what happens um, so let's have a look at a small librado striper read so this is a uh, this is a my attempt at representing what's actually going on um, it's not particularly readable um, the info all the information we're looking at here is derived from the uh, debug ms um, on the primary OSD, um, so we're looking at all the all the messaging service, all the all of the mess messenger messages that are being sent from the client, and then from the primary out to the rest of the set, and then back and then back to the client, and from that you can construct a timeline of what the requests look like. Um, I'm not entirely clear on how accurate these are. They do seem to reflect the reality. Like you can, um, yeah, the the timeline makes sense. In the sense of you, you get you get the appropriate performance you expect, um, or you're getting the performance you expect. Um, but there may be, it's it's probably not completely foolproof. Um, but yeah, so we're looking at the um, the mouse. Um, yeah, we're we're looking at along the bottom. 
you've got the uh, you've got the primary, and so that's dealing with requests coming in from the client, um, and then further up, you've got all of the the rest of the OSDs in the set and everything they're doing. Um, and the main thing we can see here is the the orange are EC sub writes. So these are updates, which is if you're doing things like taking locks, you're having to do updates. Um, so you are spending most of the time in most of the time in this operation is taken up with updates, um, writes, um, and the amount of time you actually spend reading that thin blue line that's just hitting the first eight OSDs um, is vanishingly small. So this is clearly horribly horribly inefficient. Um, cool, so I was talking about vector reads and how it's a very common um, common workflow. Um, because it's common and, and because it's got its own own thing, uh, the, the storage backends, the XRD Ceph in this case, um, but any storage backend can implement an efficient way to handle a vector read. Um, however, if you don't implement an efficient way to handle a vector read, um, it just full serializes it and you do the reads one by one. As you can imagine, this this works about as well as you'd expect. Um, it is incredibly slow to try and to try and do a large vector read um, against XRD Ceph without caching, um, because you are continuously locking and unlocking an object um, and spending yeah most of your time doing that and almost no time actually trying to read. Um, so yeah, this is a this is a hundred. Uh, this is a vector read of 100, 100 4K reads um, each, and then 10K spacing. Um, and you can see that it's taking over over four seconds. It's taking five seconds um, to do that. So this is yeah, this is about as about as inefficient as it could be, um, which is, I mean, it's it's at least nice to be able to visualize it. I think that's the only good thing about that plot. Um, so. As I said at the beginning, the uh, yeah the obvious thing if your small reads are really slow, don't do small reads, is sort of the uh, the, the obvious solution. Um, XRD, the storage framework supports many different ways to do caching, all of them with their own exciting um, quirks. Um, so yeah, we used a variety of caching caches over our infrastructure. Um, yeah, memory caches. Uh, caches on SSDs, um, and these all generally worked, um, yeah, e in general. Um, there are a few drawbacks. The main one um, is, yeah, if your caching only works and sort of making, consolidating reads into large block sizes, um, it only works if your read spacing is significantly smaller than your block size. As soon as you start trying to do a particularly sparse vector read, um, it's going to be, uh, yeah, it, it's going to be no faster, and you're going to have huge amounts of read amplification. Um, so that's that's not not ideal. Um, you still have the problem of lock contention. We're talking about, yeah, we're talking about a bunch. Of, as I say, there's hundreds of clients. There's yeah, 400, 500 individual gateways, and they're all essentially fighting for locks here. Um, so this is, yeah, even with caching, that you can't, you don't change the fact that that writes are contending, sorry, reads are contending with each other. Um, and then a particularly annoying one is that the X root and various X root decaching implementations, they are, they try to be non-blocking. So if the system doesn't have the resources to do the caching, um, it'll just pass it straight through. So you end up with incredibly inconsistent performance. Um, where sometimes reads are fast when they get cached, and then if they don't get cached, they suddenly get slow to the point of job failure. Um, you start hitting timeouts and everything. Um, so yeah, caching was ultimately a workaround, and we, yeah, it, 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 was, it was time to start thinking about fixing the underlying problem. Um, so, yeah. It, it, Optimizing XRD Ceph for, for small reads was was what we were going to do, um, or what we intended to do. Um, and the reason why we can do this is that Librato Striper, this all of this locking um, and all of that, it's it's because it, the system is designed to support interleaved reads and writes. Um, you can you can be reading an object and someone could be trying to 
truncate it or update it. Um, and that stuff should work without ending up serving people corrupt data. Um, files on Echo and on grid storage in general don't actually get updated. Um, they are, I've, I've used the term immutable by convention. Um, they affect, think files get created and then they get registered in catalogs um, with checksums. Um, they're not they're not updated in place. Um, so this is this feature, although it's very cool um, of being able to support interleave reads and write, is ultimately useless for our use case. Um, so the obvious question is, what happens if you just remove the locking behavior? Um, yeah, the implementation is a bit more complex, but basically, yeah, submit and submit an asynchronous read for every read operation in the vector, and see what happens. Um, so this is what happened. Um, it's significantly faster. Um, we're thankfully no longer in the seconds. Um, we're we're in the few tens of milliseconds, uh, which is which is good. Um, but we do still there's still a lot of round trips here. There's a hundred hundred individual reads coming from the client, and then a hundred sets of round trips to the rest of the OSDs in the well the data OSDs. Um, this is yeah, significantly better, but the, it's, there's room for improvement. Um, there, you end up with a fairly deep queue on the, on the primary. These are offset downwards every time there's overlapping, overlapping events. So you, yeah, you end up with a fa fairly deep queue, um, which is slightly strange for a, what is effectively a single operation from a client. Um, and I don't really, I don't understand it well enough to say anything definitively um, but it clearly looks like the the EC sub ops are, are happening one at a time there's something single threaded um, in there and so yeah you basically you end up with a large queue and although your reads are fast every, it can still take a while um, so this is this is better but is there anything else we can do um, and so this was where we got to the point of, I was actually just reading through some Librados C++ examples and noted that there's support for asynchronous, sorry, not asynchronous, what they call atomic read operations, or and so atomic operations in general. So this is the concept that Librados will allow you to const start creating an, a, a, a read or a write operation and then batch up a bunch of requests into one one request that you then submit to the placement group. Um, the, like the really common use case for this would be something like if you wanted to do update the, the actual data of an object and update an extended attribute at the same time. Um, but you can also just bunch up a load of reads into one and then send it out. Um, this is, I mean, uh, kind of, obvious, but this is very analog analogous to vector reads. This, this seems like a, 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 ve a X through D vector read in Librados. Um, and in testing, um, this, is, this is what the timeline looks like. It's, yeah, it's as, as efficient as you can get. It's one, one operation from the client, um, and then one set of round trips from your, from your data OSDs, and yeah, it seems to, seems to work fairly well. Um, as a quick note, yeah, we Liberado Striper still exists in this whole whole exciting uh, stack. Um, so we're not talking about an individual Rados object here. We're talking about possibly multiple Rados objects, and so that you need to construct a read operation for every Rados object that is targeted by the vector read. Um, there's nothing too complicated here, and you actually get some more nice efficiency gains here because you can do all of this asynchronously. And you can, so for a large vector read that spans a whole bunch of underlying Rados objects, you can be getting back, yeah, getting back bits of it all at the same time from completely separate placement groups, which is nice. Cool. So what about actual performance? Um, and I ha had a go at trying to characterize how much better stuff was. I'm not entirely sure about these numbers. I'll get onto that in a second. But the, uh, yeah, the summary there is that things are a lot faster. Um, so looking at this plot on the top right, we can see the original uh, locking behavior. Um, so XRDCF with no caching 
um, is uniformly slow. That's that 30 hertz-ish number that we were that we were seeing earlier. Um, the caching um, option, or the, yeah, the the original implementation with caching um, works well when you've on when you have small read spacing. Sorry, I should have said the y -ax the x-axis is read spacing. So we're going from 10 kilobyte read spacing to 10 megabyte read spacing there. Um, so you're talking about a very dense vector read going to a very sparse vector read, and you can see how the caching performance eventually falls off because yeah, it's no longer useful. Um, and then you can see the two implementations, non-locking read and then the atomic non-locking read, um, are significantly faster. Um, as I was saying, I'm not quite sure I believe these numbers. I don't think you should be able to get that many sort of random IOPS out of spinning disks, so I assume there's some sort of caching in the OSD level happening here. Obviously, it's it's not a bad thing for us. It's nice that it's fast. Um, I'm just not... I would have liked to have seen a number that actually made more sense given the, given the constraints of the underlying hardware. But that's... Uh, yeah. We, can, we can't have everything. Um, and then in production, um, we see... We, we we see an improvement. So this is uh, two two plots of our um, I'd say in, instrumented user jobs. Um, so these are real real jobs that are doing real vector reads, um, and then the duration each of those vector reads takes to takes to return. And you see on the left hand side, um, you the the, the x axis goes all, all the way up to over ten minutes, um, and is there's lots of uh, failures in there. That's what the um, orange orange lines are. Um, is failing vector reads usually due to timeouts? Um, and then on the right hand side, yeah, this is with the uh, the new implementation. Um, things are significantly faster um, and significantly more consistent, which I think is is just as important. Um, so yeah, I th I mean I think it's it's sort of been a uh, it's been a bit of a success, which is which is good. Um, so as a note, I this yeah th these changes are a significant departure from how Librados Striper actually works. Uh, as I was saying, we were sort of battling against Librados Striper's um, attempt to maintain some level of uh, yeah of atomic operations spanning multiple Rados objects um, because we don't need. Yeah, because our workflows mean we do not need that performance. We can, we can just completely strip out the locking and end up with this situation here. Um, if people were to use this um, on on a cluster where data wasn't immutable, um, yeah, there is a fairly high chance that you would just be returning, um, yeah, returning corrupt data to the end user. Um, this is, and um, that would be bad. Um, so the decision to make, to effectively recreate some Librad or Striper, Striper um, the behavior in inside XRD Ceph and then, and then change it, which is what we've done here, um, is mostly pragmatic. So we don't, we don't have to consider that. Um, but obviously it would be interesting to hear if other people are using Librado Striper. It would be really interesting to hear if other people are using Librado Striper because as far as, as far as we're aware, they're not, um, or there aren't many people out there using it. Um, but if there are, it would be nice to hear about it and understand what sort of functionality should go back into Librado Striper so that other people can use it. Um, yeah. So, uh, in summary, Reach, reach the end. Uh, yeah, I mean this isn't this isn't really a bombshell. Um, if you are using something, if you're using Librados directly, um, make sure you're doing something that actually makes sense and is efficient. And if you do that, things will generally work well. Um, yeah, as I say, it's, it's not not a massive bombshell, um, but it is. Uh, yeah, it's it's a good reminder. Um, if you have a very common I/O pattern. Um, I think it's well worth trying to understand what your cluster is actually doing, what's actually happening underneath, um, and make sure that things are being done efficiently. Um, this is a very specific example, but th things can really apply to all levels. As I say, all parts of Ceph, CephFS, RGW, 
Um, they're all doing some level of chunking up objects, um, and yeah, which results in different different Rados objects underneath. Um, making sure you understand what sort of object sizes you're getting and whether that matches up with uh, your workflows and gets you the performance you need or at least doesn't have any massive efficiency losses is quite important or can be quite important. Um, yeah, the, since this has been a massive success for us and was relatively straightforward, um, we're now interested in thinking about all the other cool Librados stuff we've been missing out on. Um, the yeah, RGWs and CephFSs um, clearly are highly optimized to make use a Ceph cluster um, and use all of the bells, bells and whistles to offload, offload stuff to the OSDs wherever possible. Um, we should probably be making sure we're doing this as much as possible. Yeah, make, making use of any of the cool things that we can do um, to make our gateways uh, more efficient. Um, a big one for us is checksums. As I was saying, like, we spend a lot of time checksumming to make sure that files that have been transferred in, um, actually the data on disk was what it was meant to be. Um, and currently there's a, we spend a lot of time reading objects back out, calculating checksums um, and updating, updating extended attributes. Um, being able to offload that to OSDs would basically double the amount of um, throughput our external gateways can do, can do. Um, so things like that I think would be really interesting um, but yeah any other thoughts and ideas about how yeah think cool cool ways you can interact with Ceph clusters at the Librados level um, would be really appreciated. Cool so a few people to thank uh, Joffish, Alexander and James are sort of have been key in all of this. I haven't done any of the development that I've presented here. I've just, the person who knows enough about the Ceph cluster to <coughs> make plots. Um, Alexander actually made the implementations um, and did a really good job there. And I think James, well, James, without James, none of this would have happened. He's really kick-started the XRD Ceph development in the last few years. Um, and then there's various other people um, who have been involved. Um, and I think that's it. I think I'm in time, and there's, that's it. Thank you. Cool. Anybody want to ask a question? Nice. So it sounds like for the implementation of this, you're running stock OSD servers and everything, but your XID staff is using a custom compiled a Librados client, basically, that has this new Librados Striper optimizations in it, right? So, uh, thanks. Uh, so this is actually, there's no, there's no modifications to Ceph here at all. This is just a changing of the way XRD Ceph um, is changing the Librados calls it makes. Um, before, it was entirely, its only interaction with the Ceph cluster was through Librados Striper. Um, and what we've effectively done is taken the inefficient bits out um, and uh, out of the using Librato Stripe, and then they are just using Librato directly now. Uh, yeah. Cool. Thanks for this uh, talk. It's a very nice, a little, a very nice technical journey and an excellent result at the end. Um, you were mentioning the the risks of abandoning the locking. Can, does the XRoot D protocol allow you to protect against this? I mean, can you deny anyone that tries to open a file for modification or append or something like this so that you can be sure that you don't enter this danger zone? Yeah, it, it's an in interesting question. Um, I think because of the distributed nature of our gateways, uh, we don't have the, there's nothing we can do at the XRoot D level because the, you know, the one XRoot D server has no idea what another XRoot D server is doing. Um, one option that I think we considered quite early on was, I mean, there's, we're removing the locking from, we, there's removing the locking from individual vectories and then there's removing the locking entirely. And there's definitely an option for us to reintroduce some level of locking that encapsulates the vector read. Um, so there's still, clients can still have knowledge that reads are going on even if you're not updating the lock cookie for every 
for every individual vector read. Um, I think that would still be fairly inefficient because the, I've really focused on vector reads here, but the analysis frameworks are also doing a lot of very small reads as well. Um, it's sort of a, a combination of small vector reads and small reads. Um, and so if you, if I think you would still have problems. Um, yeah, it's an, it's an interesting thing to consider how we can actually add some element of protection in to make this a little bit more generic. Um, yeah. Cool, thank you. Anybody else? You mentioned about the bandwidth you deliver in, from the, the cluster. What about IOPS? That's a good question. I know we, just off the top of my head, we're sitting somewhere at, no idea. I'm, I'm not going to make a number up. Um, it's, it's fairly, bec because of the caching infrastructure that I was talking about, we're talking large block sizes. Um, so the IOPS are relatively low for the data rate. Um, and that's one of the things that's going to be really interesting with this change as this gets rolled out more often. We're going to be seeing a lot few, we're going to be seeing less large operations and more small efficient operations. Um, so it's going to be interesting to see what that actually does for the aggregate bandwidth. Um, yeah, thank you. I wouldn't quote me on this, it's been a few years since I've looked at it, but like in regards to like doing cool things with Libradles, I thought there was a way that on doing operations on the object that you can, it'll cause a trigger that you can offload a plugin, activate a plugin on the OSD process itself to do something. And you're just looking for cool stuff to do, so <laughs> try it out and let me know. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that that's one of the things that we've, w that Yes, we've looked at it and been like, "Wow, if you could, if you could find something to do with that, that would be awesome." I think I looked at it to like check something with the object. Yeah. Like adding, having the OSD add its own hexadder to itself. Yeah. Something. Yeah. Yeah. I I, th I think we we did we did look at that, or at least that's that's sort of one of the things that it's like that would be cool to cool to investigate. Yeah. Um, it's a little bit trickier because if you're thinking about check something in a, an object that spans Rados objects, um, I'm not quite sure how that all then ties together, but it's. Cool. I think unless anybody's got any more questions, I'll leave it there and let us start the next session. <laughs>